You're listening to Ask the Expert on Sprott Money News. Hello, and welcome back to this month's Ask the Expert here on Sprout Money News. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford, and on the line today, we have an independent researcher from a very well-known and respected website in the precious metal community. We have Steve St. Angelo from SRS Rocker Report. Steve, thank you for joining us today, sir. Yeah, Jeff, it's a pleasure being here. So, Steve, before we get started, um, I'd really like to kind of take a moment and kind of understand where you're coming from, and likewise, the sort of genesis as to why you started doing what you're doing with the SRS Rocco Report. So when did you first become attracted to the precious metal sector? And what was the trigger event or revelation that brought you here? I think uh, I started investing in silver. I bought my first uh, 100-ounce bar back in 2002. And I I did that due to research by several analysts, uh, like Ted Butler was one. And he was talking about the upcoming shortage of silver due to, let's say, uh, increasing industrial demand, uh, and then uh, a price panic. And then, of course, we would see institutions come in and try to hoard uh, silver. And it, it happened in rhodium. I think rhodium was $10,000 at one, at one point. Uh, so that's when I started. But as time moved on, I started noticing, I started looking at energy. And I realized that at some point um, the world was going to peak in cheap energy production and expensive energy isn't really viable unless you have the markets being propped up by the Federal Reserve and a lot of debt. So then I wanted to know, okay, how is energy going to impact the precious metals, the economy, and the mining industry? And that was my focus about 2008. So I started writing articles and in 2012 I began my website. And so now I'm more focused on how this energy system uh, situation going forward is going to unravel, especially the U.S. shale oil industry that's in severe trouble. We're already down about 400,000 barrels a day in U.S. shale production, and I think it's going to fall considerably going forward. So when the U.S. is never going to become en- energy independent, it would be nice if it could, but it, it just won't. So that's why I, I focus on the precious metals because there's just way too many paper assets out there that derive their value from burning and growing energy supply, where precious metals are store of, let's say, economic energy. Uh, This is the most important fundamental, I think, precious metal investors and investors at large need to understand. So, Steve, the first question along the lines of the paper market. So the question is, do you think that implosion of the bankers' paper bullion markets will more likely come in the gold market, the silver market, or will it be more or less simultaneous? What are your thoughts on that, Steve? Jeff, I actually think it's going to be probably more or less simultaneously because uh, the price of silver spiked in, in 2011 at 49 and then the price of gold not too much longer uh, in September the same year. If you look at their charts, they're, they're almost identical, really. And, and then uh, the amount of paper, uh, gold and silver out there is just astronomical. Even though gold in the comics is more highly leveraged than silver, I think once the panic in the gold or silver market occur, it's going to make its way very quickly into the other market. So I think it's going to be more or less simultaneously. Excellent, Steve. So moving on to a question about pricing. The question is, is it possible to estimate rational fair market prices for gold and silver today? If so, at what prices would you pay gold and silver today? You know, that's a tough question because that gets to the basics of my analysis. And uh, it, it... it's based upon, in the past, especially, let's say, from the 1971 to 1980 period, uh, people said that the reason why the price of silver skyrocketed was due to Hunt Brother buying. Well, why did gold go up to 850? And then why did uh, the price of oil go from like $1.80 in 1971 to $35 in 1980? Who was buying all the oil? Well, you see, in that time frame, Gold went up 15 times its value, silver went up 16 times its value, oil went up 16 times its value. So the precious metals were a a, a hedge against inflation, and the inflation was energy because energy runs the markets. Well, if we fast forward to today, we saw skyrocketing oil prices, and thus we had skyrocketing uh, silver and gold prices. Now that we've had this decline in the price of oil from over $100 uh, a few years ago, now down to the 40s, this impacts the cost to produce gold and silver. 
So in, that's the way I believe the algorithms and the market is trading gold and silver. But that's a different, that's not its true value. Its true value is a store of value compared to most assets. And most financial assets are IOUs that are based upon burning energy in the future. But you cannot put a fair market value for gold and silver when 95 to 98% of the world's funds have been siphoned or funneled over the past two, three decades into financial assets, whether they're derivatives, retirement accounts, treasuries. These are not real assets. These are paper IOUs to be paid in the future. And they can only be paid in the future if you have not only an energy supply, but you must have a growing energy supply. And I believe we are going to start seeing, especially this year, a peak and decline of U.S. and global oil production, which will put severe pressure on most financial assets going forward. Then we will start to see some of that 95, 98% of funds moving into the gold and silver as real stores of value. That's when their values will be more rational. But right now, they're not rational because most people are invested in IOUs. So, Steve, let's take a look at the banking industry and likewise, what role they play in these IOUs that you're speaking of. So the question is, can the bankers themselves survive the next crash for which we all know is coming? Well, we know from the uh, the past example in 2008, the the, uh, U.S. investment banking system went belly up. I mean, Lehman Brothers uh, just evaporated. and it, It was around since the Civil War. So what, what, wasn't, what was remaining was uh, absorbed into the commercial banking industry, which was propped up by the Federal Reserve. So what you have now is a, is a commercial banking industry that's just being propped up with liquidity and leverage. Now, how this unfolds, it's hard to determine, but I would say a good portion of the banks probably won't make it. But some banks will have to. They will have to remain in some form of a banking kind of system. But I think we're going to see massive failures of banks uh, during this next crash. But it's hard to determine determine which ones are going to be left are allowed to fall and which ones are going to continue using as a system. Even if we start seeing gold as a currency or backing, they still may use some of these banks to have trade and to have uh, business activity. So uh, it's going to be interesting. But I think we're going to see large bank failures going forward. So sticking with the idea of banks, so see what frightens you more, the steadily evolving war on cash or the likelihood that the banksters will instigate some major real war? Jeff, those are two good considerations. And I think the, the war on cash I'm less concerned about because there are 88 million Americans without checking their savings accounts. And then there's the illicit drug trade that comes into the U.S. It's, it's hundreds of billions, maybe a half a trillion dollars. And that's all funded by, uh, by $100 bills, by actual currency. Couldn't survive using a debit card. Just wouldn't work. So the thing is, even though it's illegal, I think it's kind of allowed for a certain reason. So to me, uh, the poor not being able to use, uh, they can't have a checking account, savings account. Uh, I, I don't think we'll go to a, uh, a true 100% cashless society. So that's not a big concern for me. What is could be uh, a likelihood of real war? And let me just preface that. We've had several world wars and we've had several regional wars and depressions through the last 100 years. And we all survived that. If we had another war, it would be devastating because there will be a lot of people who will be killed. Uh, and then my biggest concern if it moves into nuclear. But if we do not have any nuclear weapons used and we do have some kind of crisis war, even though that's horrible, what's even worse is the threat of the peak and decline of U.S. and global energy reduction because you have all this infrastructure, Jeff, that we have we have designed and built, and it runs on a certain amount of energy. Well, what happens if you have half that amount of energy? It becomes increasingly difficult to maintain and run this uh, very widespread uh, mobile system in the United States. That, to me, is the biggest threat, and it's also the reason why I believe precious metals are probably the most uh, the safest assets to own going forward. So, Steve, as of lately, we can see that India has been the topic of much discussion within the precious metal space, 
particularly because of their overwhelming demand, but likewise their gold monetization scheme that was implemented recently. So looking at India, India is now a major player in silver as well as gold demand. What accounts for the sudden surge? I think it goes to the Indian people, their, the culture of why they purchase gold and silver. They purchase it as a store of value. Uh, and it's gone back for generations. Unfortunately, the West has been, I, I actually call it hoodwinked, or they've been hoodwinked in, into believing financial assets or wealth. And so that's kind of like been a brainwashing, and especially Wall Street makes a lot of money on those kind of commissions, fees, uh, continuing to run a financial-based asset system. And what is interesting, analysts thought that Indian silver imports would fall in 2015 due to lowering of import tariffs on gold this year. However, it, it was the exact opposite. I think, according to ETF securities, we're going to see silver imports in India reach almost 9,000 plus metric tons, up 43% this year. So it, they didn't switch to buying more gold. Well, they, they are buying more gold, but they're buying a lot more silver. And I think they see these lower prices. They, it's not sustainable. And so, and it, I just saw this on Zero Hedge. Uh, the Indians refused to give their gold to the government. I think only 30 kilograms were, have taken part in the first week of this gold monetization scheme. So you might see this take place more in Western countries like the United States, uh, but India is their more their culture. Even it might be gold jewelry, and they wear it. It is a dowry. It is their wealth. So I don't see that changing. I just see it getting worse or demand increasing going forward. Uh, as well as Asia. And so what we saw this year was for silver, we saw a huge increase in silver imports, which is bar demand into India. Whereas in North America, US and Canada, it was more official coin uh, purchases. That's where the, most of the silver went, uh, demand went into North America. So Steve, from reading your articles in SRS Rocco Report, we know you definitely have some expertise in silver. So let's stick with silver at the moment. So the question is, is there any money to be made in the silver miners? If so, which ones? Likewise, what do you think of the recent silver Wheaton deal with Glencore? Actually, I'm one of the uh, many analysts now that are... Uh, they think you should just own the physical metal, and I think that's wise. I think you should have. A, I think individuals should have a good holding of precious metals, physical. But I don't see a problem investing a, a small amount uh, if you if you're of modest means in the mining industry. And I believe the silver miners are probably the best miners, and there are several out there. But I think owning the precious metal miners, the silver miners especially. When we have this huge, let's say, reset, uh, it'll be hard for individuals to acquire silver bullion. And we almost we had really bad shortages for the last uh, four months from June to September. It's eased up now because we didn't see a continued crash of the stock market. So what happens when individuals can't get their hands on bullion? Well, the next best thing is to go into the mining shares. Well, the mining shares don't have that uh, shortage of metal. So their stock prices, there's no limit to where their stock prices can go. And I think because the primary silver miners use so little energy in producing silver compared to the gold mining industry and the base metal mining industry, where 70% or byproduct uh, metal industry, where 70% of the silver is, is produced, I think silver primary silver miners will last a lot longer in a peak oil environment. So they are the safest bet. Now, uh, quickly about Glencore and Silver Wheaton. Well, Silver Wheaton's business model is to take advantage of the situation, and you can't you, you can't uh, criticize them for doing that. And so they're getting uh, they paid 900 million to get silver at 20 percent of spot. So after they pay all their bills over the next 20 25 years, they, they can net based on the current spot price, they can make a, a billion dollars. So that's not a bad deal. However, going forward, when the base metal mining industry starts to become under stress of peak oil, I see base metal production declining. That's where peak silver will occur first in the base metal mining industry. So it's going to be difficult for companies like the royalty companies like Silver Wheaton 
to uh, streaming companies as well to access or to continue to get their silver streaming agreements from these base metal miners. It, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out in the future, but I do believe the primary silver miners are the better, better investment going forward, uh, better even than the uh, silver streaming companies like Silver Wheaton. So let's move on to silver investment, Steve. In your view, what is the best way to invest in silver right now? Well, you see, that, that is, that's funny. Uh, I, I listened to this interview about a, a gentleman who was processing a lot of the Vietnamese that were coming over after the Vietnam War. And some of them were coming over with buckets, uh, you know, suitcases of Vietnamese money. And the guy looked at him and said, sorry, we can't give you anything for that. Well, a few of the uh, farmers and a few of the more modest uh, Vietnamese people, they, they, they turned in their silver and gold coins, their gold coins, and they got dollars. So uh, I think it, the, the, it will always come back to the physical. That's the safest bet. You know, the Exeter's Pyramid, it's the safest bet is, is physical gold and silver. I think people need to own that either at home in a safe or at a private facility. But let's say they're not comfortable with doing that. I think the next best thing would be something like a Sprott physical silver uh, ETF, because not the SLV, uh, because Sprott actually guarantees delivery of silver. You can actually get delivery of silver through Sprott. You can, it's very difficult, almost impossible for a typical person to get any silver. You just get uh, your shares and paid in money. So to me, the best thing would be physical silver, if you don't want to go physical silver or you want to kind of have two different options, the physical trust, uh, the Sprott's physical silver trust, and a small percentage in the silver mining industry. I think those are probably the, the, best, the best investments going forward. So, Steve, looking at the state of the global economy, we can see things are just slow as far as any sort of growth overall. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any sort of recovery in sight. And likewise, within precious metals, we know that things are being manipulated, so we're not really dealing with real markets. So things kind of look bleak. But that being said, what's your outlook, Steve? Where do you think we're going right now within the market? Yeah, I agree, Jeff. I think the, uh, the the morale, the market sentiment, precious metal sentiment is is at an all time low. And I think this last uh, the shortage that we had in the silver product industry, in silver products, retail silver products that started in June due to the possible Greek exit, increased uh, when the Chinese market started to really crash. Uh, and then the, 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 the fear of the Shemitah or a, a forecasted collapse of the U.S. stock market and Western markets in, in the fall really pushed investment demand in physical silver, I mean, really uh, uh, to levels never witnessed before. And actually the shortage from, Jan, from uh, June to September, U.S. Eagle sales were like 18.5 million in just those four months. If you go back to the shortage in the same period in 2008 when the price of silver fell, it was about 6.1 million. So we had three times the amount of sales of silver and the shortage, and we still had a shortage. So once this, we did not see a, a, a crash in the markets. We didn't see a black swan event financially. Uh, investors pulled back on buying silver. And so that's what we're seeing now. So the shortages are starting to be worked through and, and surpluses are st starting to come back in. Also, industrial demand is falling. So right now, the sentiment is low. But the, the thing is what investors need to focus on going forward is the energy situation. And that's where I differ from most precious metal analysts. <clears throat> I believe the manipulation is taking place because of the, the, the funneling of funds, the world's funds into financial assets that have no future. And I think we're gonna see US oil production decline 30 to 40% by 2020 and 60 to 75% by 2025. That's only 10 years away. But I think increased stress, will be, we'll start to see this unfold in the US energy industry as well as the global oil industry because Saudi Arabia can produce oil at 40, but they cannot support their, their government and their, their welfare programs uh, at 40. So they're selling U.S. Treasuries. It's a disaster waiting to happen. So when we start to see more stress on oil production falling, companies going under, production actually declining 
more rapidly. Uh, it's going to put severe stress on the central banks and the Federal Reserve to prop up the markets because in the past, Jeff, when we had a depression in the 1930s, oil prices declined, silver prices declined, gold prices declined up till 1933, and so did silver production. Silver production fell like uh, in the U.S. 70 percent, globally like 60 percent. We we didn't even see any decline in silver production uh, when we had the crash in 2008. So we right now we have falling commodity prices, falling energy prices, falling precious metal prices, but we have an elevated stock market. It is a total bifurcated market, and it cannot continue. Once investors get a whiff, and they're beginning to get a whiff, wealthy investors are beginning to understand something is really wrong with this current market. We will start to see more investors move into the precious metals because we will start to see this unraveling of the greatest financial Ponzi scheme in history. So even though morale is low right now, Jeff, I think investors need to focus on the fundamentals. And the fundamentals show that precious metals will still be the most safest assets to own going forward. Again, we've been speaking to Steve Satangelo of SRS Rocco Report, and we urge our listeners to go to srsrockoreport.com to read some of the great stuff that Steve is putting out there. And with that, Steve, we'd like to thank you again for joining us today on Ask the Expert. That's been a pleasure. Thank you, Jeff. Wonderful, Steve. And to our listeners, thank you for listening. This is Jeff Rutherford for Ask the Expert here on Sprott Money News. Thank you for listening and have a great day.